Riding my motorcycle at 70 miles an hour is where I meditate. You feel the sun or the rain or the wind. You're one with the world in an incredibly sort of naked way. You're vulnerable. You're on a moving object. So it's like everything becomes crystal clear at that point. There's just you and that moment. I've been dreaming of doing a cross-country trip on my motorcycle. My mom hates the idea. She thinks I'm crazy. Why would you want to do a thing like that? Actually, she hates that I ride at all. Adrenaline junkie, she calls me. I'm a bit of a loner. Growing up a mixed race kid, not fitting in where my father's family was from or where my mother's family was from. I'm most comfortable alone. But for years, I've been watching the number of women riders grow. I'm going out to find them, ride with them, and hear their stories. I love the wind. I love the sound of the engine, the smell of the gasoline. The freedom, the fact that you can't think. When you're on the bike, you have to concentrate, so all your cares go out the window. You're just paying attention to your ride. It strips everything down to the basics. I ride because it feeds my soul. Every single time, it's just a sheer rush of like, yeah! I was young. I thought it was cute to be on the back. Huh. As soon as I was on the back of a bike with a woman driving in the seat, I was like, I can do this. It's way more fun in the driver's seat. I'm Mac Deal, and I'm a police officer by day and androgynous model by night on New York Fashion Week runway. My dad and I were gearheads together and I worked on small engines as a little girl. And my dad was really encouraging. It was a really easy transition to go into motorcycling. It just made sense. The one that I mainly ride now is my newest bike. It's a 2017 Victory Gunner. The riding position is straight out, like I like, a little sporty, and I outfitted it with everything I have to have. Right away, when I get a bike, I put on crash bars. If a car knocks your bike over, you actually have a chance of saving your leg because of these crash bars. Always keep little wrenches. Every little screw, hex screw, they just come undone with the vehicle's vibration. It's just gonna happen. And this is a mini air compressor that you hook up to your battery that uh, if you get a flat tire, you can repair it right on the spot. I have heavy duty tie downs because a lot of times when um, roadside assistance comes, they don't have tie downs for your bike. But when I park in the city, I take this T-shirt and I put it over the front wheel so even during the daytime, it's a lot more noticeable when cars are coming by, they're not gonna hopefully hit your tire. And then the last thing is a cramp buster. And what you do is that you don't have to grip anymore and you just push down with your palm. My name is Wendy Crockett and we are at the Cycle Smiths in Curtinville, California, which is the motorcycle shop that I own. I have a beautiful little girl and a wonderful husband that facilitates my motorcycle passion. Their existence intrigued me. I would get the Harley Davidson catalog in the mail and it was just something that always called my name. This is a 2005 uh, Yamaha FJR 1300. My husband and my daughter, I have my Rosie the Riveter who is now a zombie. One of the most important things on the bike, my personal locator beacon, I have two GPSs, two different toll transponder tags, an auxiliary fuel tank. So I can do upwards of 450 miles in a sitting. My custom seat, Bluetooth dongle, my hydration jugs, 
I am a DFF, which stands for delicate fucking flower. And don't you forget it. I have no idea why I started riding motorcycles. I was shortly out of college and I got this wild hair up my ass to go get a 1979 Honda CB750. I didn't know what that was. I didn't know what that meant, but I knew it was like $600. And so I was like, I'm gonna go get this bike. I grew up spending summers with my dad's family in India. My cousin Polly would take me everywhere on his motorcycle. He's proud of me now, out here doing it on my own. I never felt fear riding with my cousin. But now it's just me figuring it all out. Last time I need to fill up before getting to Chicago, which I'm glad about. The rain is thick. It's the second big storm I've driven through to get to Chicago this morning. And it is intense. I didn't plan well for this. My GPS system is not waterproof. All right, here we go again. I get these big ideas and run at them full speed, fearless, until the moment I realize I'm actually in it. Maybe not capable, totally terrified. Maybe my mom was right. This is a crazy idea. Why am I doing this? We all do something in our life that is not that safe, right? I don't know what it may be. You know, it's just like walking up to a stranger who's smoking a cigarette and be like, you know, that's gonna kill you. Well, no shit, but I'm an adult. I'm making that decision. Motorcycling is just like that. The first day, I thought I was gonna die. It's because it's skidding down this monster hill on this huge bike. I just I didn't have a clue what I was doing. But I always came home with a smile on my face. I was so scared. It was like the clutch. I was scared I was just gonna fly off on it. I was gonna pop a wheelie. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. In the US, I discovered the woman rider community. When I was in France, I didn't know any girls riding. It was so empowering. I had never before been around just a whole group of women that rode. Cause I've seen men on motorcycles all the time, you know, but when I saw a woman, just owning it, and then you hear the loud pipes, roar, you hear me roar, you know? <laughs> I'm like, that's really, really cool. When we started with the Victory Riders, we were the only females on the Victory Visions. So when we went to the first rally, literally everybody froze when we pulled in. And they stared at us like we were from another planet because there were two women on a Victory Vision. And we always get, that's an awfully big bike for a little girl. Are you riding with someone else? And it's where's like, your no. husband? Right, where's your boyfriend? Where's your husband? Because they assume that as a female, even if we do ride, we can only ride a certain type of bike. Oh, where's your husband? Or where's your boyfriend? Or, you know, you didn't ride that here by yourself, did you? Do you have any idea how much that weighs? You'd never be able to pick it up if you dropped it. He's like, whoa, that's a big bike for, for a gal. I'm like, it's a big bike for anybody. <laughs> it's like, ha ha. Only men say it to women, where, they, where they'll go to a woman and see that she's riding that motorcycle. Oh, you know, that's not that safe. That, that bike's kind of heavy. Will they walk up to a guy and say that? One of my least favorite things is men making eye contact with me in traffic. Not a problem. But one of my first times going out on a bike, I was on a little 450 Nighthawk. I was just tootling around town trying to get comfortable with it. And I stopped at a convenience store and I got a gallon of milk. And the man behind me said, where do you think you're gonna put that, honey? In my saddlebag. <laughs> I was just like taking it back. And he goes, what are you, one of those dykes on bikes? And I put it in my saddlebag, go scrambling home, I pull in the driveway, and I'm like, what's a dyke on bike? <laughs> to 
to my husband and he goes, oh boy. I truly just, I didn't know. But that is a stereotype and clearly it's not the truth. It's just the way people think. When we joined our victory group, it was the same thing. Missy and I joined the victory group. We were the only two women on Visions at the time. And I think for the whole first summer we were together, nobody would ask us straight out, but they thought we were a couple. And then we were at um, this function called the Apple Pie. And we were standing there talking one day and I said to them, I said, you know we're not a couple, right? Like we're not together. And they go, well, we were kind of wondering because you're not very affectionate to each other. <laughs> but they still were questioning it, right? And uh, I said, well, we've been friends forever, but we're not girlfriends. And how long have you guys been friends now? Since elementary school. Yeah, elementary school. So over 40 years, pretty much 30 years. You admit to that? Yes, I'll admit to it. <laughs> yes. When we joined the group, we were the only two women riding at the time. And I think we kind of helped inspire them because they saw us riding and they're like, well, they're doing it. We're the New Mexico chapter of the Femme Fatales. It's a women's motorcycle club. It's international. We wanted something that was just women, that was independent, that was law abiding. And they blessed us with letting us start a chapter here. So it actually was a perfect fit. We're the Piston Annies, and it's a group of about 13 girls now. And we're all kind of different, but all the same, we like motorcycles and riding. There was not really girl motorcycle groups here. We were always so inspired with the other girls that were riding, but you know, in different countries or different rural areas. So it kind of started with just a little talk and a little bit of drink, and then from there, we we're like, let's create the group. I am one of the creators of Bikes and Mics because every one of our riders has a voice. We're all inclusive, so we have gay, straight, bi, we have different gendered people. A lot of our people are gals and we ride together. We're all about women riding. We want to be together. We want to be there for each other, support each other in like a sisterhood, and then we want to help the community. Women on Wheels, breast cancer fundraiser. They were doing a yard sale to collect money for breast cancer. We joined a group that already existed. There are certain rules that a lot of these groups follow when they form, and one of them usually is that there's charity. I know that historically this goes back with all different kinds of motorcycle groups that existed long before we were ever riding. And we all don't have a lot of free time. We want to spend our free time in a way that's very intentional and in a way that's very rewarding. Well, there's a vulnerability to motorcycle. You're out there. You're not protected in like a steel box or isolated. So you have that, there's part of you that has to, I guess, embrace that vulnerability. And I think those same people that allow that, they are also generous. Everybody's got a story about breaking down in the middle of nowhere or being stuck in crappy weather or having judged distances wrong and being stuck at nighttime someplace or not knowing where you are and somebody else reaching out and helping you. I went and bought this Honda with a wad of cash in my hand from like my bartending gig. And I'll never forget the look of the guys in the garage as I somehow just thought that I would just get on it and ride away. I don't know how I didn't die that ride home. I'd ridden a buddy's dirt bike once or twice. I had no real tangible skill and really no, I shouldn't have been on that bike, but I got on the thing, it was like, kung, 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 like pulling out of the driveway, the clutch was jumping and skipping and somehow I kind of learned how to control the thing, like just a little bit. And I've really been learning ever since. My dad took me on my first motorcycle ride when I was about three. I believe that first ride planted a seed in there somewhere, but my mom said no, so of course. I turned 18 and moved out and bought a motorcycle. Started on a 550, so it wasn't a huge bike, and started with the training class. I dropped that bike more times than I can tell you until I figured out just one time all of the dynamics worked together, and I said, oh, there it is. All right, great, we got that. So I was aiming for a career in medicine, but I kept thinking, ah, oh, how much fun would that be? to play with motorcycles for a living, like to just every day do what you love. I never really think of a, a bike before, but uh, one time I was with friends camping and a friend of mine, he had a, 
as poster. And he, he took me on the back and he went really fast on purpose, <laughs> just to scare me. <laughs> and it was a really weird feeling the first time on the bike. We just like drove for half an hour and I was so scared, but at the same time, fascinated. I was like, oh, wow. And my future husband, we started dating and he took me for like, to go around and after probably like six or seven times with on the back, I was like, I'm missing something. I don't want to be on the, on, on the back. I want to have my fun. So I start taking lessons. So in France, it's way more complicated than in the US. You have two exams. It's a slalom, but you have between 19 seconds and 21 seconds to do it. You have to go slaloming, then make a U-turn, and then make an emergency stop within 20, 20, within 20 seconds. So it's really, really hard to that exam. It was kind of a challenge, because my friends were like, oh, you're going to fail, you're going to fail. I was like, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. I got my license. I remember I, a friend of mine, I, I was like, oh, I got it the first time. How many try did you do? Oh, three times. Oh, yeah, well, I guess. Rosario, go by Rosie, and this is my bike, Jesse. Uh, Jesse's genderless. I've had Jesse for about 13 years. It's my first official bike. I really like Jesse because of the colors, and a lot of people think it's a Harley for some reason, so I think it's a bigger bike, but it's actually not. It's a 650. So if you look at the color of it, though, which is what I love about it, it's like the Wonder Woman colors, and I'm a huge fan of Wonder Woman. I'm half Mexican, half Dominican. I grew up with a mom who basically told me I couldn't do the things I wanted to do because I'm a girl. One of them was to play the drums in fourth grade, and my mom's like, no, you can't because you're not a boy. That's for boys, and you're going to play the clarinet. Then I wanted to be in martial arts, and she was like, oh, no, you can't do that. You're going to get hurt. That's for boys and I wanted to own my motorcycle and continue riding motorcycles. And she's like, no, you can't do that, you're not a boy. So I do those things now. I mean, I do play drums, I have a motorcycle, and I'm in martial arts. I currently teach, I coach, and I will always be a student of uh, Muay Thai. It's something that I'm looking forward to retiring in the near future as a gym owner. And it really is all thanks to my mom. <laughs> She told me that I couldn't do these things. You know, I have a motorcycle that I own outright because she told me no. And I've been able to play in bands in all my 30s because I learned how to play the drums. And now I'm going to be a gym owner in the near future. It's funny though how it came full circle for me when I sat down with my mom and needed to ask her for, for help into moving into the next steps for owning a gym. And we sat down and, and I said, Mom, you know. This is something I really want to do, but I'm going to need your help a little bit. And the answer was yes. I fully support you. I know you're going to succeed. You're going to make a very good gym owner. And, and some other stuff too in Spanish. But I think I was just kind of in shock. I got emotional and I was like, my mom basically just fully supported and wants to authentically help me out. In, doing this dream that I have and fully supporting what I want to do and to see all that kind of like from like no 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 you can't do this to yes I know you're gonna succeed was just something that just finally hit me. If a 
guy can do it, I can do it. I don't ride to prove a point, to prove that I can. I ride because I can. That is the point. Going through the hills and seeing the scenery, not being in a hurry, taking our time. That's the kind of riding I like, where it's just riding just for fun, just because we love it. When I pull off my helmet and they see that I'm a woman rider, there's something very different about that than just being a motorcycle rider. I'm a tall woman. I just kind of did what I found enjoyable, and I was often the only woman doing it, and it didn't really even enter into my mind um, that this was not something I could be or should be doing. I see other women needing and feeling like they need permission to ride. If I had waited for people to give me permission for stuff, I wouldn't be where I am today. Even though my parents were encouraging, if I ever asked permission for something from them, it'd always be no. And one of the no's was music. I said, I really, I really like this thing called band. And I was in fifth grade. They're like, no. We don't have time to drive you to rehearsals. We don't have time for this and that. So for three years, I secretly was in band. I borrowed an instrument from the teacher. It was our little secret. I went to band. And they were like, oh, for God's sakes. And I'm like, well, I'm really good. I'm actually first chair and all this stuff. And then I had the band director talk to them and say, hey, she's really good. Let her stay in it. And what did I end up getting a degree in that took me to college? Music. I'm a conductor for the women's ensemble where we play just music composed or arranged by female identified people. And I get to play in bars downtown, cabarets, speakeasies. So from that point on, I learned never to ask for permission for anything. And I think that's just translated to everything I do, whether it's motorcycling or whatever, because I saw what happens when you ask for permission. You give people permission to, to make your life choices and that's not okay. <laughs> She is a 2015 Harley Sportster, and she's a she. I knew that shortly after getting her. And at the time in my life that I got her, she was exactly what I needed. A reminder of strength, courage, power, drive. She's small enough where I can dance with her. She literally becomes an extension of my legs. We get into those curves sometimes, and it's just nice. We can salsa. I mean, we can just truly embrace one another. I love her size. She's simple in her design, even in her color. Easy. A simple little bike. I call her peanut butter. Some people call her sand because she's got that shimmeriness in there. The only thing that I changed on her were the pipes. I put these slip-on pipes myself. They are a little expensive to have installed. So I went ahead and slipped those on myself. She, <laughs> not being a mechanic, she did fall off and there's scrapes from the very first moment I put, <laughs> put them on and rode with her. So that's one of the marks of her past. And that's another reason that I don't sell her. She's worth more to me than she is worth her value. She has been therapy in so many ways. She has helped me heal in, in different parts of my life that I didn't even know I needed healing. Some of the mountains and the valleys that we cross together as sisters. This bike has taken me there. She's almost turns me into a bird and I can fly. I enjoy her. I enjoy every part of her. I get to be with my father who has passed when I'm on her. And I get to show him different parts of the world that he would have never seen. Apparently my dad was a biker before I knew him. And now that he's gone, I hear stories of him being a biker. For some reason, even before I knew that he was a biker, I would get into the mountains. And what you see in a car is different than what you see when you're on a bike. You become part of the background, part of the environment. I can connect with my dad and feel his strength as a biker 
It's a strange thing because I spoke openly about my love for bikes with my dad. Since I was little, I could hear bikes go up the street. And I, I would say, when I get grown, I'm going to get a bike. And I'm going to marry it. And I'm going to bring it into my apartment. I'm going to park it in the living room. <laughs> She's perfect. You mad, Evomas? I just love you. Gosh, you make riding even much more exciting. You're going. You're going. motorcycle. I love it very much. This is my passion flower, neutral light. I made this sissy. Um, it works real good. This sissy bar has been with me all of the miles that I put on it. I've got this little ledge on the back so I can put a fuel can here if I want to or other little small packs for easy access. And then I got my tool roll right here. This is my super important, superstitious, protective talisman. These earrings that my mom gave me have turquoise on them, which is a protective stone for traveling. And then it's got protective runes, too. That's why I don't have all my safety equipment on here. I have it covered. <laughs> Victory Vision. Mine's a 2014. I picked this bike because I wanted a luxury bike for long distance riding. I love the comfortable seats. I love the heated hand grips, heated seats. The windshields on these bikes are great. They go up and down. You have the option to have the wind in your face, which is a nice option, or you can raise it up if the turbulence is too high on the highway. I like the luxury of the radio. We do listen to music on our long cross-country trips. You gotta have a coffee cup holder, very important. It swivels with your bike so you don't spill your coffee. Another useful tool to carry in your bike, if you don't have one already, ladies, is this device here. It comes in a nice little, you can order a little case for it. But this is for women who have to use the restroom but don't have one and it allows you to urinate standing up. People give me a lot of crap about having a mirror in my bike, but they all want to use it. <laughs> what made you first decide to ride? I got dared into it. My ex-husband dared me. We went to a motorcycle show because somebody gave us tickets, and uh, a girl there was saying that she was going to do it, and he goes, I do, you won't do it. The girl never did it, but I did it. I invited her to come along. And so we went for the weekend and we took the motorcycle safety course. And um, I've been riding ever since. Mm -hmm. And now I teach that same course. 
I did have anxiety when I first started, a lot of anxiety, my first year of writing. And every day I said, I don't think this is gonna work out for me. This is not, I'm not comfortable. And I was just very anxious every day, but I kept making myself do it. Why? Because I knew if I challenged myself to do it, that I would love it and that I would get used to it. And my anxiety was from me being new and being afraid. Like Missy said, it's different being on a motorcycle course and learning how to ride than it is to be on the road riding with other cars. I was afraid that uh, I wasn't going to be technologically be able to figure out the clutch and where all the buttons were. You know, can I really do this out on the road with cars coming at you? around on the road back and forth, trying to stay in my lane. Very difficult, very tiring. I don't know that much further to go, a couple of hours. control what you do, you can't control what other people do, so you just want to always be observant. There's some times where I'm like, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do this, I don't want to get on the highway, you know, I can't do that, and I do, and then afterwards I'm like, you know, I feel so good, because I didn't, I didn't just like give up and say, no, I don't want to get back on, I'm a little too scared. No, get right back up and I still, I still follow through with the ride. My name's Meredith Younger. I live in Providence, Rhode Island. I went to the Rhode Island School of Design to study ceramics. I tend not to sell my work. I tend to collaborate with artists that I truly deeply admire, and so the work comes pretty few and far between. This figure is aged fella whose eyes are closing. He's in the waning parts of his life. There's a mirror, and the other side of this figure is a child that's being reborn. And you see yourself inside the belly of the child. So it's like a womb tomb transformation cave. I've started to have some pretty strong feelings about what it means to make something in clay, about how, what a life force clay is as a medium, how it moves, uh, how it has a memory. When you fire a piece of clay, it becomes permanent because you rob its water. So it feels a little bit like taking its soul away. I try to be pretty intentional now about the sculptures that I make and about the meanings they have because I know that they'll outlive me. I think that one of the things that draws me to motorcycles so much is the same thing that's really driven a lot of what I do in my ceramic work, which is exploring this line between life and death or you know, just that kind of like liminal structure in between those two ideas. And when you're on a motorcycle, that's when I feel I'm at that closest line because you're just flying, but you're just so close to the other side, as it were. So it really feels like exploring that same transitional space and it's exhilarating. I worked in trauma for six years and I had seen a lot of really bad motorcycle accidents. Uh, a lot of uh, men, women with uh, road rash, broken legs, uh, crushed ankles where they had to amputate. And so, yeah, I was afraid of riding. The fear eventually went away to the riding course and I just felt empowered. And I said, man, this is so much fun. I had a Yamaha FZ07 until yesterday uh, when it got totaled. Um, and I took that across the country. Uh, you had a bike that got totaled yesterday? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was in an accident just a couple blocks from where I live. Uh, and the bike was totaled. I'm OK. I have a few scratches. And you're back here riding today? Today, yeah. Uh, quick turnaround. About 24 hours for us back on two wheels. I would say the most memorable, very scary moment was it was near Damon. I was going northbound. And I was just going over this elevated area of I-55 where you could smell um, bread 
at that time of the night. And I remember seeing in my side mirrors these two headlights coming really fast. The car had to have been going at least 100 miles an hour, if not more. And I see it about to hit the front of my bike. But whatever angle that car was coming at, it just, you heard it go like this, it hit my tire. And do you know that nothing happened? It was an act of God that there was like some kind of like imaginary energy bubble or whatever around me and that I didn't die. I should have died. This is the one that I almost died on. You can see where the paint scrape is from when the car hit. Oh, yeah. See? Nothing happened to me. I was very conflicted the next semester at school. I had always planned on a career in medicine, and my, my school was going that way. I had been riding for a couple of years, pulled out of the parking lot on my motorcycle, and this lady just, I saw her roll through the stop sign I, we made eye contact and she just jammed it. I shattered my pelvis and I, you know, spent a fair amount of time in the hospital and in a wheelchair. We woke up Saturday to do the group ride. I just something, I, I just had this odd feeling and uh, I was coming around the turn and uh, saw a dually come down and cross the line. I kept thinking if I go into the curve hard that I, I would be under him. So I, of course I let off. You know, when you stand a bike up, you know, the, you're going to stand up out the curve. So I drifted over, and we ended up meeting in the center line, head on with the uh, dually. Mm -hmm. Broke two vertebrae, clean through, and they don't know how to sever my spine. Both femurs, tib fib, right hand, humerus, radius, almost every rib, scapula, sternum. I stayed conscious, though, in and out. The other thing, believe this, I had four nurses behind me. What are the odds of that to be out there in the middle of nowhere? <laughs> you know, the doctors, they were losing sleep over how to put me back together. He did say and that. And what, yeah, <laughs> what way to, to fix what first. So I didn't think after Diamond's accident I would ever write again. And I just didn't think I could, I could do it. I think the biggest encouragement was from the women writers. Like, and so when she had her accident and all these women came together and helped us get through it, I felt like... I sort of, not owed it, but I felt like I had, if all these women were helping us, I, I needed to still be a part of that community. I got so much encouragement and support, and I really believe that was part of my healing. Mm -hmm. All the positive energy that surrounded, you know, us. It was really interesting in the time right after my accident, how many people that I barely knew felt free to say, well, clearly you're going to stop riding now. You would be stupid to continue riding now. You had this wake up call. Obviously, uh, you know, this is something that you will uh, ride off as a childish pursuit and move on and be a grown up. Um, but the impact on me was quite the opposite, which is life was short. I wasn't doing anything wrong. This was not something that, you know, I had made a mistake. This was something that can happen to anybody. It didn't scare me away from riding. It scared me to think that I would live my life doing something that was drudgery. My takeaway was I want to do the things that make me happy in this short time that we've got. I was with a group where a girl went wild on the corner and she had a head-on collision with a truck. She died instantly. The only thing I've seen is like the girl's bike under the truck. I was wondering, like, should I keep riding? It's a dangerous hobby. I'm gonna stop when I won't be able to be on the bike. Everyone knows somebody who's died from a motorcycle crash. Yes, it's true. And you have to sit with that. Every case is different. Was it rider error or was it, you know, someone else? Was it weather? Was it the culture of sport bike riding versus cruiser riding? Very different types of riding. It just depends, you know, what the story is. You can't just say they had a motorcycle and they died and so you shouldn't ride. I mean, I've had people say, you're not gonna get back on. And I went, well, if you get in a car accident, you get back in a car. I have things that I like, people I love. I don't want to cause them any pain, so I don't, I always try to be careful. I don't ride faster than I can. I, I always try to be really safe. 
I like to make sure that the people I'm riding with live the same life. Though we come from different backgrounds, I want to make sure they have a family that they care about, as I do. I want to make sure that they have siblings and aunts and uncles and loved ones, friends that they need to return to. It keeps us all safe. It keeps us all in the same focus that we want to have a good time. However, we still want to get home. Personally, I feel safer in a group because I feel like they can see the group versus my one bike. And what's your favorite thing about riding? The camaraderie of uh, everybody else that's on a bike. It's, it's almost like when you see birds flocking together, you're like, how do they read off of each other and just move together like that? It's like, it's hard to put into words, and, but it's called entrainment with motorcycling and leading the group. And I'm huge on hand signals because I'm a visual learner. Like a conductor, you have to have very clear signals of what you want. You have to be very clear, like you're gonna stop or we're gonna go or it's gonna be single file. I like to be in charge of that because people are gonna be safe. They're gonna know that, oh, if Mac is leading, we're gonna be okay. Cause she knows while she's leading us, I'm counting women to make sure each one of those ladies comes out of the curves. If we leave with eight, we're gonna have eight by the time we come out. I'll put the newer riders in the middle so they don't have to worry about trying to catch up because you have the more experienced riders behind them to help them move along. And then if I'm in the front, I'm gonna make sure that those newer riders don't have to make crazy decisions like, should I run this red light or not? Or to stay in the pack. I'm never gonna put them in that uncomfortable position. A lot of it is getting out of your own head. I don't know how to put it any other way. Like you have to, your self-talk has to be positive. So you're like, this is great, I'm having fun, I can do this instead of worrying about, oh, I gotta pull the clutch, I gotta put the brake on, I gotta, because you know, that's how I was when I first started riding. I was overthinking everything. And then as I started to relax, I stopped doing that and just started enjoying the ride. It was really hard for me to take up the oral space of riding a motorcycle. I'm generally a fairly quiet person. So the jump of getting onto something that makes a lot of noise and then to claim that space to actually give yourself permission to do that was a really big one to make. It's fine. And then it gets easier and easier until you don't really even think about it. These complete strangers continue to welcome me into their lives. They've become the reason I get back on my bike every day. Mac incredulously looked at what I have with me and gave me her reflective t-shirt to cover my black backpack at night. Missy and Teresa, who just completed 12,000 miles on their bikes, encouraged, you got this. I feel like as women, if you take on something that's scary and you challenge yourself and you're like, I'm gonna learn how to do this thing that's scary for me and you do it, if you don't do it perfectly, you failed. It's like, no, you get to fail. You get to fail all over the place because that's how you get to the good stuff. So even me, after all these years of riding, I'm on this incline, I slide backwards, my foot slips, my bike falls on the ground and it was at this very awkward angle and I couldn't get it up. And I was so mad. I just I started crying because I was pissed. And so I had to go find someone <laughs> to help me get my bike up. And I was just like, that kind of stuff scares me. Cause it's like, I don't want to have to rely on some random person to like save me. I don't want to, I don't need that. Like I want to be able to save my own damn self. And the fact that I couldn't in that moment and I had to ask for help sucked, but I did it. And if something goes wrong or you get scared, that's okay. I mean, you, that's okay. Sometimes I get scared too and still do it because when you're on the other side of it, you'll be like, yeah, you know what I used to be scared of doing too? Crawling and walking. But now, they don't scare me so much. I had been thinking about it for a while, secretly. And then a very dear friend of ours had a headache, had a brain tumor, had surgery, and passed a spirit within seven months. I thought, what am I waiting for if I'm really gonna do this? I'm now the proud owner of a brand new Hyosung 250, and it's a blast. I would say I've been riding for probably 21 years, with breaks in between, because I had children, I was pregnant, and wanted to 
<sighs> I guess stay alive. And then I realized, oh my gosh, my health is bad. I can die anyway. So I got the bike. Husband got the bike because he realized she keeps going in and out of the hospital. She's always wanted a bike. If I lose her, at least I'll give her the bike first. My husband actually bought this one. He bought this one as a birthday gift. It was one of the best gifts I've ever, ever received. I didn't know it was coming. Eastside Harley did a great job. They had cupcakes sitting on the thing, balloons. My name was on it. I absolutely love it. So I'm here to stay, ladies. I remember I watched this woman drive down 4th Avenue. I distinctly remember she had like dreads and this, this like big coat that was kind of flapping open. And I just remember being stirred. Like, I want to be like that gal. I went through this, this relationship and I always rode on the back of her bike. And when we parted ways, I remember thinking, like, I really enjoyed riding with her. And I remember one time expressing that to her and saying like, I could really see myself getting my own bike and learning how to ride and like riding beside you. I remember saying that to her and having it immediately shut down. Like it was like, no, that's not this, this is, that's not what this is. Like you ride on the back of my bike and that's what it's gonna be. When that relationship ended, I decided that I wanted to explore it. My name is Tamale Sepp and this is my motorcycle. It is a Honda VTX 1300 and my dog that rides on my motorcycle. This is my saddlebag. And I don't make this super readily apparent to everybody, but this is like having a Tupperware box in your trunk that has all of the things you might need in an emergency. This little roll bag is great. So in here, I have this little knife that can also slip into a wallet pretty easily. It's like an origami knife. It's obviously got a blade, but you can like fold it up and put it into your wallet. I've got, like, if an accident happens, I've got some cards, I've got Bikes and Mike's cards. And in here, I always have these little kits, right? So it's like nail polish, sewing kit, little, little things in here that are helpful. That's really awesome, nice little compact situation. Also, big fan of this, electrical tape. It's awesome for when you are riding into, if you have like a full face helmet on and you're riding into the sun, you can take this and make your, like a quick um, visor, right? Always have a little collapsible cup in case you're thirsty. Oh yeah, of course, flashlight. What? Ooh. I'm also a sucker for post-it notes. I like to leave notes for people I know. First aid kit, always important. If you get a little scrape or something, you wanna be able to handle that. Extra tire valve covers. Because sometimes you put some air in your tire and forget to put the valve cover on it. You've got these to back up. And also air pressure checker. So again, just like just some cool things to have on hand in case, in case you need them. It's better to have them. A friend of mine a few years ago passed away and for a memorial ride that we did for her, and I just never I just never took this one ribbon off. The other stuff I took off, but but this one, this one can stay. So it's a little weathered and I'm sure at some point it'll probably fall off from wear, but I'm gonna let it, you know? I like to put little things on my bike all the time, like little steampunky rings like this. Little, just little decorations, they're pretty small. You just wiggle them down. They don't, people mostly don't even notice them until they do. It's just like a feminine touch, I dig that. And of course, because I'm a lady, She's got these beautiful Dazzle Gem liner. My bike is basically a drag queen. Like a really, really tough drag queen. Bink, bink, bink. Wanna go for a ride? I didn't ever want to ride my own until I started riding on the back of my then husband and I think maybe lasted a few months. I was like, no, like it's time for me to get my own. I want, I want to do this myself and have control. I do always joke that the best thing my ex-husband ever did was when I said I wanted a bike of my own, he brought one back that was covered in cobwebs out of somebody's backyard, rust, flat tires. And so all summer long, I ended up taking the bike apart and just breathed new life back into it. I ride a Triumph Tiger 800 XC 2013. 
and absolutely love this bike. So the, the bike came fully decked out with short hand levers, which are good for riding off road, the hand guards, of course, heated grips. I upgraded the lights to a brighter light. I try to get off the road by sunset, because um, at sunset usually is when wildlife starts to come out across the road. I don't really want to be surprised by that. I do a lot of solo camping, both kind of on-grid, off-grid. In the US, it's pretty easy to find some campsites that are nicely set up, but sometimes in between destinations, it's kind of fun to just go down some dirt roads and go to some backcountry wilderness and find some pretty off-the-grid camp locations. I have my tire irons and an inner tube for the rear tire, since I can use a rear on either the front or the rear, just in case I get a flat. Of the 100 pounds of luggage that I take with me, I have it divided a certain way, where in here is all of my kitchen and camping equipment, stoves and tools. In this pannier, I have all of my camping equipment, such as tent, sleeping bag, air mattress pad. And then in here are all of my clothes. So after I bought the bike, I switched out from soft luggage to hard luggage because I like locking cases when I'm traveling. They are weighted equally, so that way when riding off-road or on-road, things are balanced on the bike. On the back side are a personal medical kit, which you know, in case something happens off-road. I don't lock them because I want them easily accessible. And then this one is a motorcycle medical kit. In case the bike breaks, something happens, I have access to that. So this is the tool roll that I carry. I basically make sure that I have everything I need for everything from doing an oil change to chain maintenance to making sure that I have something, you know, a wrench for every bolt that's on my bike. Like I, I get laughed at for having a, you know, a, a dead sheep on my motorcycle, but it is, it truly is a butt saver it, on a long trip. It's, um, it's very comfortable and cushy. The only part is when it rains, it smells like wet dog. <laughs> it's the only thing I don't like about it. It just, it fits. It, it's a very comfortable ride. I've had bikes before where I, even though I owned the bike, I can tell it wasn't mine. And this bike and just how it rides and how it's set up is very much just like an extension of me when I'm riding on road or off road. It's super comfortable. I can remember the very first time I realized I could combine my passions of motorcycling and traveling. Uh, I was in Joshua Tree, of all places. This motorcyclist comes scouting our campground and doing a round, and I motioned like for him to camp next to us because I wanted to hear his stories. He would just travel the U.S. by motorcycle. And it was that moment that I realized, like, I want to do what he does and take a long trip. The following year, I was divorced. I bought a new bike. I wanted to take myself out of my comfort zone. My first trip was around the Southwest for six weeks. When you're on a long-term trip, you start to get into what I call survival mode. So it strips away everything down to the basics. You just need shelter, you need food, and I need warm clothes to keep me secure until I get to the next destination. There's definitely a lot of self-reflection that goes on during long days, long hours. I shed all of what I was holding on to. I use the helmet time to kind of reflect on where I've been and think about where I want to go in the future. For our honeymoon, my husband and I rode our FJRs up past the Arctic Circle to a little town called Anuvik. 
afterwards, people were like, well, that was a terrible choice. Who would ride an FJR up to Inuvik? I said, well, we owned FJRs, and now we've been to Inuvik, and you're still sitting here planning for the perfect situation and the perfect bike and your perfect trip. And meanwhile, we had a great adventure. I finally convinced my husband that uh, maybe not necessarily that it was a good idea, but that I wouldn't shut up about it. And so he <laughs> relented. And we began planning to spend the better part of a year riding around South America with our five-year-old daughter in the sidecar rig. In terms of your daughter traveling with you, how many trips has she done on uh, in the sidecar? She's been riding in the sidecar since she was four months old. I would venture to say she's got more sidecar miles than uh, most motorcyclists have miles. It's also one of her favorite places to be. And I tell you what, it, nothing makes me happier than, you know, you'll, we'll go pick her up from school or, uh, you know, dance class in the sidecar. And not only do all the other kids think it's cool, but she'll say, let's take the long way home. I think as much adventure as we can throw at that kid, she's willing to take. How many states have you been in in the sidecar, do you think? Um, nine. Probably pretty close. Or ten. Or eleven. Every day we go, I find something different every day after another. These are all from different places. Are those places you've been to? Yep. It's getting awesomer every day. Uh, I had a, a 2016 a 48 model. <laughs> I rode that thing 1,500 miles. And it, it was, was a windy. little two-gallon tank. Man, we had to stop every 100 miles for gas. But I wouldn't trade that trip for the world. It was amazing. <laughs> I love to ride because it just fills my spirit. It just fills my soul with happiness. Um, I never thought that riding could just fulfill me like that. All my senses are engaged. And the freedom of the open road and just, I think it's my healthy addiction. I still have hugely healthy respect for the motorcycle as a beast that goes very fast. And it's a force of nature unto itself. Like I never get sick of talking about the puzzle of it and the mechanics of it. They're miracles. Like combustion engines are incredible. One of the big reasons that I decided to go to motorcycle school in the first place was because I wanted to be able to travel cross country by myself. And I didn't want to be at the mercy of mechanics who might not take me seriously. And then beyond that, I wanted to be able to teach my friends and other women how to do that because it sucks to go into a motorcycle shop filled with dudes who might not take you seriously. Not that all dudes can't, don't do that, but you know. There's this one dude that I was in school with and he was like super man's man, total macho dude. He had a hoodie that he wore all the time that said, fuck your fucking feelings. You know, he had a mohawk and he rode a Dyna and it was like all pimped out to be like the loudest Dyna ever. You know, it was just that guy. He posted a video on Facebook shortly after school ended and it was him teaching one of his girls how to drive. And like his son was in the back complaining that he wasn't getting to drive. And he was like, no, it's the girl's turn. So now I'm gonna teach the girls. And this dude was like, yeah, being in motorcycle school with Mayor, I was like, wow. Girls can wrench just as good as the rest of us. Maybe it's time for me to start teaching my girls how to use all the same equipment that I've been teaching my boys on. Like, she really made me see that girls can do all the same things that boys can do. I try to do at least one big challenge every year the U.S. go and meet the top people from other countries to do these big challenges, and it is called the GS Trophy. It's a big BMW thing. It's like riding through mud and sand and over logs and rocks and doing tight turns. It's skills. In the middle of the summer, I did this obstacle course out of the BMW Rally in Salt Lake City. I wanted to see how well I could do and prove some things to myself. We had to ride through these like truck tires. That scared the bejesus out of me because it just basically rattles your fillings out of your head. It just heightens any experience. Going to Alaska was the most alone I have felt in my entire life. There's something so vast and just open about the Alaska landscape. 
that makes you feel really small and really alone. I'm exposed to everything that's around me, and so there is an element of vulnerability. It's a beautiful feeling. At the same time, it's a really tough feeling to comprehend. I had to be okay with being alone again. I graduated at 17 and joined the military and uh, served during Desert Storm. And I saw how much people take for granted. So when I came back, I told myself, I will accept every challenge, grab everything that's offered to me. You know, I've, I've been to Scotland because somebody said I can't go. I didn't know how I was gonna do it, but I did it. And I operated heavy equipment for 16 years in a man's world. And every time they said, do you wanna learn this? I said, yes, go ahead. And they, they laughed, they sit back and let me fight a machine until, you know, but I figured out. When I was born, I had a birth defect, cleft palate. And I was asked by my physicians, who were wonderful, and my parents were asked to help me to be strong. Because when you have a birth defect that's visible, and I even look differently then than I look now, the world can bully you a little bit. And so they wanted me, my physicians, to be strong. So my parents did a really good job about helping me to be strong and independent. And I joke because sometimes they made me too strong and too independent and then we would fight about it a little bit. So from the beginning, they helped me to be very comfortable in my difference. And I do have goosebumps right now as I'm telling you this because the thing that really excites me the most about it is that I'm doing it. I did it. I did it. That six weeks really just rejuvenated my soul and kind of set me out on the path that I've been on for the past eight years. Seeing new landscapes, building confidence and independence that I lost while I was married. Motorcycling by myself gave me back my independence. I am the sum of my past, but it does not mean that I have to take that past with me to my future. There's no better way to see the world than on two wheels. All of a sudden, you're more approachable. You see more, you feel more. It's, it kind of heightens the senses. And for me, it's been a challenge. I wanted to see how many different continents I could ride on and go to and see what's out there. I picked up a bike in Bangkok. There's no better way to understand, you know, cities like that than you, you line up at a stoplight there, you and, you know, 50 of your closest biker friends, you, you know, and it's, it's just crazy. Being on a rental bike, with camping gear, riding the streets of Bangkok during rush hour, and you're splitting lanes. You think splitting lanes in LA is crazy. Try it in Bangkok. Riding Iceland, where all of a sudden the road stops being paved. There's no guardrails and like a 20% grade off camber. And you're just kind of like, okay. And at the top, they tell you, is, you know, the gate's up, you can go, but at your own risk. And that's ring road, that's the highway. <laughs> and I'm trying to think of what the next one's gonna be. I mean, I'm trying to get to Africa next summer. So traveling around the U.S. was great um, experience, but I wanted to travel internationally to really get a taste for what other countries are like. I visited 13 countries in total, going from Los Angeles to Ushuaia and 18,000 miles. I used 331 gallons of fuel. I had four flat tires, eight different jump starts, I slept in 98 different beds. Of the 187 days that I rode, 156 of them were sunny, which was remarkable. There are a lot of different endurance riding events out there. The Iron Butt Rally is the biggest, and it happened to be my first event ever. I got third place in 2013. I had my name in contention for 2015, but found out my daughter was on the way, so passed on that year. The 2017, I got seventh. For me, the puzzle element is so compelling, and the idea that, uh, you know, next, next rally's puzzle might be something so incredible, I wouldn't want to miss out on it. It's not until the night before the rally begins that you will get a list of waypoints. From there, you have 14 hours to 
process all of these waypoints, decide where you're going to go for the first leg of your rally, get a good night's sleep, and be ready to start the event the following morning. The complete unknown of this type of adventure is, is really a big part of the fun. The goal is to gather as many points as you can between point A and point B without being late for point B. This was my fifth event, and I happened to this year win the event, which is the first time a woman has won. I have ridden more Iron Butt rallies than any other woman, and my motorcycle has completed more Iron Butt rallies than any other single vehicle, which is pretty cool. That has been very exciting to have been part of something different. You know what I mean? To have a woman win this event. It would be really cool if people look at that and it changes the way that maybe they look at us as riders or us as women. They can say, this sport isn't me, but this sentiment is. It is not any more or less of an accomplishment than all of the men who've won before me. It is a noteworthy accomplishment to win, but as a woman, more people are like, wait a minute, this is not so unattainable, unapproachable. I hadn't ridden outside of the United States before. I flew down to Lima and got a motorcycle from a friend of a friend and just went tooling all around the country, which was amazing. There was so many women that I talked to down there who were like, I can't believe you're doing this right now. Like, women here don't do that. I can remember very specific times of just little girls in Latin America getting so excited and just like pointing and like running alongside of just like that I was a woman doing it. I think there needs to be more women who can say that they were inspired by women instead of men. All the girls were all from different backgrounds, different cultures, different like age groups, but we're all still kind of united in a way where we're all women, we all have the same problems. You know, don't feel alone. You think you're going alone for something bad. You know, actually your sisters might be going through it too. And we just talk it out and we lift each other up. What really lights me up about our group is that we respect each other. We enjoy hearing about each other's lived experience. And we have a darn fun time doing it. That's very valuable to me. You realize I found my tribe and I'm home, and I love it. Coming from a community where I didn't feel connected to anybody, I was sort of lost between worlds, trying to figure out what my place was in life. And because of that, had very low self-esteem, went through a lot of bullying in school. And when I first learned to ride a motorcycle, I suddenly had a community, I had a group of people that were like-minded, I had support from strangers who didn't care what my background was. It transformed a somewhat broken kid into a woman who was able to make a lot of her dreams come true. It gives you a sense of pride too when you get on that big old bike and you learn how to ride it and you can take those corners and you can do those things that seemed so scary before. Then you feel proud of yourself and that's, that's no one but you. I love how people that I may have hugged but never danced with, I can get on a bike and we can dance harmoniously. I mean seriously in sync. They, I, I can anticipate their next move. I know when they're going to go right. I know when they're going to go left and we sway and we flow together. The more you ride with people, you start to feel that and understand how they speak. Every time I ride, I learn something new about myself. Having to experience everything as it comes, whether it's hot and humid or cold and windy or, you know, gorgeous 70 degrees where you can like smell the pine trees that you're passing. Grow older without getting old. And this is one tool to achieve that. When you're trapped in a body that's not working properly, to be able to get on a bike and just soar go wherever I want to, as fast as I want to, as slow as I want to. It makes me feel free, it makes me feel strong. It makes me feel empowered and in control of me. 
that's how I fell on my bike. You know, I work a lot with older individuals in a hospital setting and in hospice. So I, I get to talk to people and they're, when they're in the, you know, nearing the end and you know, asking words of wisdom. And I, I've been told so many times, don't live a life of regret. As dangerous as motorcycle riding can be, I would rather go out that way. You know, if I go out doing something I like, I'm not reckless, but I also know that we all gotta go sometime. You can't let that inhibit you. You can't, you can't let it stop you from doing what you wanna do. It's given me this tool where I can always put myself right at the edge of my comfort zone, where comfort and safety and danger all line right up. Like, I love that motorcycling puts me in that place. I think it's our responsibility as motorcyclists, as human beings, to constantly be pushing ourselves, to finding out where that boundary is and like take that next little step. It was a big day, 518 miles today. Beautiful ride. So happy to be at my destination and yes! Fear is actually a very healthy thing. Fear lets you know that you're alive. It lets you know that you're challenging yourself. It lets you know that you need to proceed with awareness and caution, but that it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be doing what you're doing. To be able to take a look at what you actually want and what your heart is calling for and allow yourself to just be like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to go do that. That's pretty awesome. And the most amazing journey I could ever have expected. I accomplished a dream that I'd always wanted to do, which was ride a motorcycle cross country. I did my first big solo trip. I challenged myself. I learned to open my heart in a way I didn't know I needed to. And I had the time of my life. This is my zen. This is my release. This is my connection to that which is both greater than myself and deep within myself. You can't put those moments into your GPS. You can't plot a trip to the place where your soul will heal or grow or quiet or shout for joy. You just have to put yourself out there.